I'd like to begin tonight by talking about how the press always seems to get the wrong argument, it always seems to focus on the wrong argument in any kind of important issue that comes before the day. For example, we've been hearing now for two weeks about Richard Clark and his testimony uh, before the commission investigating 9-11. We've uh, had endless arguments about what kind of person Richard Clark is. I saw Newt Gingrich the other night saying that Clark was an opportunist who was uh, resentful about not getting promoted, and Gingrich really gave him a going over on somebody's television show. And we hear all this stuff back and forth. Is he telling the truth or not? With so forth and so on. Was Bush really focused more on Iraq than the war on terror? Does Bush have a private agenda and so forth? No discussion has focused at all on what might have provoked the 9-11 attack. There has been no discussion that I have seen relating to the 9-11 Commission hearings about the foreign policy of the United States, about the idea that if you keep bullying other countries, if you keep giving money to Israel and to Israel's enemies, fomenting conflict and destruction and death in the Middle East, if you have United States troops in Saudi Arabia at the home of the Islam religion, if you are supporting dictators in Pakistan and Russia and other countries around the world, that maybe terrorists can get enough support from fed-up people to be able to do a great deal of damage to the United States of America. No discussion whatsoever about whether a change in foreign policy might be necessary. Now, here's another example of how the press focuses on the wrong thing. In the last 24 hours or so, there has been discussion all over the cable news channels about the fact that one of the jurors in the Martha Stewart case failed to report his record with the police when he was being investigated for jury duty before the trial started. Now the question is, will there be a mistrial over this? And so on and so on and so on and so on, endlessly, endlessly. And, of course, we have to see while they're discussing this, the clips over and over and over again showing Martha Stewart walking out of the courthouse and so on. My God, you would think that with those cameras rolling all the time, they could get more than 15 seconds of clips that have to be shown over and over and over and over again to have something on the screen be besides the talking heads. But anyway, the point is that it doesn't really matter whether this juror had some kind of a run-in with the police before he went on the Martha Stewart jury. What does matter is that Martha Stewart was convicted not on any investment malfeasance, but rather for lying to investigators and obstructing justice, as they call it, and yet, this juror came out as soon as the trial was over, appeared in front of the television cameras, and said that he hoped that their verdict would be a victory for the little investor. I don't have the quote right in front of me. I should have gotten it together before the show started. But at the first break, I'll get it out and give you the exact words. The point is that he apparently voted for conviction of Martha Stewart because he thought she was guilty of something that she wasn't even being tried for. Now, if this isn't grounds for an appeal, I don't know what is. Once again, I watched a number of cable news shows discussing this over the last 24 hours or so, and no one mentioned it until just before this show started. My wife and I had just finished dinner. We were in the kitchen, and we had one of the cable channels on, and some attorney mentioned it in an offhand way, and, of course, immediately the subject was changed. Here's case number three, Dennis Koslowski and the Tyco corporate case. Koslovsky is accused of having taken money out of Tyco. A mistrial was declared in that case just 24 hours ago because of some crazy activities on the part of one of the jurors. In all the discussion I have seen since then, I have seen references to the fact that Koslovsky looted Tyco of $600 million. And when I say references, what I mean is that practically no one can open his mouth about this case without using the phrase that he and his associates looted Tyco of $600 million. I hate to break it to these learned commentators, but he hasn't been convicted of anything. Nothing has been proven yet that he looted this company of $600 million. All we know is that some federal investigators have tried to tell us that he did. For all I know, maybe he did, but no one that I have seen on television or myself or you or anyone else, except maybe for Dennis Kozlowski, his close associates, and maybe one or two other people know for sure exactly what happened. Koslovsky swears that the money that he took out of the company, he had permission to take out of the company, and the person who gave it to him is now dead, the former chairman of the board. So we have no definitive answer to that, and yet all of these people on television are talking merely about, now that the mistrial has been declared, what that will mean 
for the next trial of Kozlovsky when he's retried and for the other corporate scandal cases that are in the mill right now. No one has in any way whatsoever suggested that he might be innocent of these charges and that before we make all these definitive pronouncements on the future of American corporate and investment affairs, that we ought to wait and see what the verdict is in the trial when it actually takes place and is completed. One last thing is that nobody ever questions what these people in the federal government, the prosecutors, the U.S. attorneys, and the federal regulatory agencies like the Securities and Exchange Commission declare to be the truth. Anything a government official says is automatically assumed to be true, and therefore it can be the assumption upon which these learned commentators can give their learned opinions so that we can become more learned about what's going on in the world. And yet all we know, as I've said to you so many times before, is what government agents, government officials, government employees want us to know. What they leak to the press, what they announce to the press in press conferences, all of this becomes the facts on which we base our decisions. And yet it is obvious that there are probably thousands of people in federal prisons, state prisons, and other incarceratory facilities around the United States today who are innocent of the crimes for which they were accused. It is obvious that a number of people who were on death row have been cleared of their crimes because of DNA evidence. And yet we are to assume that the next words that come out of a federal official's mouth must be the absolute truth. If you go to my website, harrybrown.org, Right at the top of the home page are, is a link to a page that is links to articles and websites mentioned on this broadcast. Tonight I've posted three items there. There are two articles by Paul Craig Roberts pointing out that all of this stuff about corporate scandals has a side to it that is never discussed on television. One is the fact that so much of what may actually be true was provoked and caused by SEC regulations. The other article that I posted by Roberts is a critique of the Sarbanes-Oxley law, which was passed by Congress a year and a half ago in the wake of these scandals, and all of the terrible damage it's going to do to corporate America and to the investment markets. And lastly, there's a book link there by Paul Craig Roberts called The Tyranny of Good Intentions, which shows what federal prosecutors and state prosecutors have done to our justice system in the last few decades. We'll be back right after this break. You can call me at 1-800-510-TALK and give me your opinion on all of this. This is Harry Brown. I promised you to give you the exact quote from the juror, and when I went to get it at the break, my computer crashed. So I'm going to try again at the next break. I have to say that I've been quite happy with Windows XP. I have had it now for about nine months since I got a new computer last July, and my troubles with computers have been far, far less than they were with previous versions of Windows. But nothing is per perfect. You often hear criticisms of Windows or computers in general. I have not too infrequently get by email somebody's little diatribe about what if your car operated like Windows where you'd have to restart it all the time and would conk out just when you need it the most, this, that, and the other thing. And it's a cute little list of comparisons. But the fact is that the comparison should be between Windows and what automobiles were like 20 years after they were invented. And if you did that, I think you might find that Windows holds up quite well. And in another 20 years, perhaps in another two years or five years or 10 years, it'll probably be crap proof. But that's not what we're here to talk about tonight. So let's talk with Guy in Fort Myers, Florida, and see what's on his mind. Good evening, Guy. Hey, Harry. All right. Uh, this is kind of off the subject, but i got to ask you, so I'll make it brief. You know, I voted for you in 2000, of course. If you had become president and you take away the power of government, you take away the power of special interest. If you were to legalize drugs across the board, you take away the black market for uh, Colombian drug cartels, uh, so on and so forth. Um, don't you think there would be some personal backlash, both physically and financially, if you were to become president? And if so, what would you do to deal with that backlash uh, from special interest and from the black market drug trade should a libertarian become president? Well, once drugs were legal, there wouldn't be much else that the drug dealers could do because they would be out of business. Now, they may be very resentful, and somebody might want to get back at the president and the members of Congress and other people who had voted to put them out of business by ending the insane war on drugs, but I wouldn't consider that such a problem. And besides, I guess I could say that George Bush manages to have his secret bunker someplace to protect him. Uh, I suppose I could have the same thing if I were the libertarian president, but I doubt that I would. I doubt that we should look at public officials as being any more entitled to protection than ordinary citizens are. But I really don't think that it is a big problem. I may be missing something, but it's not anything that I lost any sleep over, maybe simply because the odds of being elected were so slim. <laughs> I understand, Harry, but uh, in order to uh, become passionate about the libertarian cause, and I 
I don't mean it as being a, you know, like a religious cause or anything, but I am very passionate about politics, and I am a hardcore libertarian. So to, in order to become totally engulfed by it, I, I have to think about scenarios like this. What sure. if a libertarian was to become elected president? You'd be the mouthpiece of liberty, and those special interest groups who have milked off the government for years and years and years now get the, the rug pulled out from under them. What's going to happen to the person who steps up and does exactly what the libertarians propose? Well, one thing I did say from the beginning of my run in 1994 when I was running for the 1996 nomination and election is that I would never trust my security to government agents, and I would make absolutely sure that any security that I was going to have would be furnished by private agencies that I paid for and made absolutely sure were dependent upon successfully defending me. And I would think that with that, we would be inspiring a lot of inspirational ideas about how to protect the president without keeping him hidden from the American people and doing a much better job of it than the Secret Service has done, which failed to protect Ronald Reagan, John F. Kennedy, James Garfield, William McKinley, Abraham Lincoln, and I guess that's the that's the whole list of the ones. Well, that puts it into perspective, Harry. That's exactly what I was looking for, and thank you very much. Thank you, Guy. I appreciate your call. We were talking about how the media treats big public issues when they come up and seems to almost uniformly throughout the media focus on some minor issue that is tangential to the real issue which in the case of the 9-11 Commission should be how American policy may have provoked the 9-11 attack. In the Martha Stewart case, how a juror could announce that the verdict was a victory for the little investor when there were no investing charges brought against Martha Stewart. The press in discussing this over the last 24, 40 hours seems to ignore that entirely, and how in the Tyco case they have presumed the man, Dennis Koslowski, to be guilty of sin, having looted the company of $600 million, simply because that's what a U.S. prosecutor says. And we've had some interesting emails all focusing on this, and incidentally, just because I start the show talking about one thing doesn't mean you can't bring up a call, a question, an email on some other topic. But we've had a lot on this. Eric says, if the media is a private and for-profit venture operating under a free market capitalist system, then how do you explain their ability to constantly fleece the public? Or is it the public really just prefers fantasy rather than truth? And are these trials just watching the empire throwing Christians to the lions? Well, there may be a certain amount of the fascination of watching the Christians being thrown to the lions and that the media may recognize that people like to see that sort of thing. But I don't really think that that is the nub of it. The first thing we have to realize is that the media, especially radio and television, which is where we get most of our news, those broadcast media are a closed system. You cannot just start a television station, a television network, a radio station, or a radio network. You have to have permission from the government. And it's not that the government is simply going to investigate you and say, we're not going to let you have a license unless you promise never to criticize the government. It is that any time in the free market, in a really truly free market, when someone is failing to give the public what it wants, when it is failing to reassure the public about the safety of the product, or in the case of news about the truth of the product, somebody else would spring up and say, hey, here's an alternative where you can get this and I can prove my competence, prove my veracity, and so on. But you can't do that in the broadcast media because you've got to go through an enormous process to get permission from the government to operate. Fortunately, today we have the Internet, and it is almost impossible to overstate the importance of the Internet. It is a true revolution in information. Yes, there's a lot of bogus information that gets passed around by email and so on. Yes, there are a lot of ridiculous sites of people with ridiculous conspiracy theories. And it is a haven for everyone, good, bad, or ugly. But the fact of the matter is that you can get the good off the Internet that you can't get on radio, television, or maybe in your local daily newspaper. This has changed things considerably. It means that now there no longer is a closed shop in information. And it means that we are going to get information much faster. I think I've mentioned on this broadcast once or twice or maybe a hundred times before that after previous wars, it was only several years later that the historians dug up the true story of how the war started and things that were going on that were misrepresented to the American people during the course of the war. And by the time the historians dug up that information, it was no longer of interest to the American people because their children were home from the war and they were no longer being taxed to death for a war and they just didn't care. They wanted to get on with their lives then. But now, because of the Internet, a great deal of this information is becoming immediately available. Foreign correspondents are telling us things that are going on in Iraq or Afghanistan or Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan or Pakistan or Colombia or Russia, or China, or things going on all around the world that we wouldn't have heard about in ages before. We would have had to 
20 years ago, subscribe to a bunch of English papers, Australian papers, in order to be able to get viewpoints that weren't readily available in the United States. And we would have gotten papers coming to us by mail that would be two, three, four weeks late. It just wasn't worth the trouble or the money. Now you can log onto the Internet and find out things that happened yesterday or even this morning. And it is changing considerably the complexion of politics, of world affairs, of what politicians can get away with. I think George Bush would have gotten away completely with all of his deceptions about Iraq if this had been 20 years ago. Certainly Ronald Reagan got away with a lot. Even George Bush's father got away with a lot 10 years ago. Well, it's a little more than 10 years. But the Gulf War started in early 1991, and the Internet was just nothing at the time. It was in existence, but you didn't have it on your computer. I didn't have it on my computer. And it was very, very unlikely that any of the kind of information that came out after that Gulf War was available to you or me or anybody like us during the Gulf War. So nobody criticized George Bush Sr. Nobody pointed out his deceptions. It only came out after the war that Iraqi troops were not massed on the Saudi border, that that young woman who had said that she'd seen babies ripped out of incubators in Kuwait was really the daughter of the ambassador to the United States from Kuwait and had never even been in Kuwait at the time of the incident she supposedly reported. It's a new world, and the Internet is going to create opportunities for truth that didn't exist before. Bob has sent an email titled simply The O'Brown Factor, <laughs> and the message is just, Harry, you've got to do it, help. I think The O'Brown Factor is a play on the fact that Air America, a new radio network, just went on the air this past week. It's been put together by liberals to try to counter the conservative domination of talk radio. One of the personalities on Air America is Franken. What's his first name, Tom Franken? Uh, the one who bitterly hates Bill O'Reilly and Rush Limbaugh, and he has decided to call his show The O'Franken Factor. Well, Right at the moment, there's no old brown factor in the works, but I would love to do a television show because it would reach far, far more people than we're reaching now. Kayleen in Massachusetts says, I agree with you on your view on government mouthpieces giving us what they call facts in the news media. The biggest problem is that the American public in general take these statements as fact. In other words, they are not skeptical enough. She goes on to say, why don't we, the American public, learn to think for ourselves, form our own opinions? Why? Because the general public is so numbed by the media that they haven't the desire or in some cases the ability to do so. When and only when Americans learn to think for themselves and take on personal responsibility, which comes along with personal liberty, will we free ourselves of this mass media garbage, which is no better than the dictatorships in communist countries we complain about. Well, I agree with you in general there. The problem is that we don't want to put the cart before the horse. First thing we have to realize is that most people have lives to lead. And they don't spend as much time paying attention to politics and social problems as you and I might do. There's nothing wrong with our paying attention to it, but we can't expect everybody else to have the same interests that we do in the subject. They have things that they can control, that they can affect in their own lives, and they put the emphasis there. And I understand that, and I do not condemn them for their so-called apathy. But the cart before the horse is the problem of thinking that Americans must be made more responsible before we will get personal liberty. The fact is we will get responsibility only after we have personal liberty. If you want people to be responsible, to take responsibility for their own lives, to worry about the consequences of their own acts, then set them free. Quit shielding them from the consequences of their own acts. All right, before we go to other topics that are on the emails, let's get back to the telephones and talk now with Jonathan in Washington, D.C. Good evening, Jonathan. Hi, Harry. How are you doing? All right. Um, Franken's first name is Al. Al Franken, Al Franken. yeah. yeah right. I don't know which uh, which uh, is more obnoxious, him or Bill O'Reilly. but uh, Or my memory. <laughs> it's going to it's be a contest over his, who's more annoying. Um, a couple of things I wanted to say. It's actually kind of coincidental that you uh, brought up this topic about media coverage because I had this article, this Associated Press article that I read this past week that I wanted to bring up the next time I called you, which was called, uh, the title was Networks Hold Back on Iraq Footage. And um, it's all about how, uh, it specifically talks about how the, those four U.S. civilians who were killed in Iraq recently, mm -hmm. um, they, they were burned and then their bodies were dragged through the streets and then hanged from a bridge. And the networks didn't want to touch it, in, uh, generally speaking. And I'm saying, show it. This, this is what is actually going on over there. If it's upsetting to people that U.S., that American civilians are being killed in this manner, well, listen, that's, that's what war is. And uh, maybe it'll make people think twice about it. Well, what's a, your opinion about it? Well, it's hard to know what the reaction would be. Part of it will at least seem to be generated by the press. In other words, will the reaction be, oh, my gosh, this is what is happening to Americans over there. We've got to bring those boys home before any more of them go through that. Or 
Will they react by saying, oh, these terrible people over there, we got to go over there and kill them all, send more troops over there? And part of what we perceive to be the American opinion on it is actually simply the press opinion. So often we hear on television or read in editorials or op-ed pieces or magazines or wherever that the American people want this or the American people think that or the American people are outraged about this when all we're really getting is the opinion of the person stating this. I mean, I could sit here and tell you that Americans would elect libertarians in a minute. They really want libertarians to be elected if it only weren't for the ballot access laws or something else, but I wouldn't really be speaking for the American people. I'd be speaking for myself, and so we never really know, but my point is that I'm not really sure what the reaction would be to that kind of coverage, but I think that the coverage ought to be there, and I think that it would be entirely in keeping with the so-called responsibility to family values to preface any pictures by saying these are going to be pretty gruesome, so if you want to change channels or you want your children to leave the room, have them do so now. Yeah, well, that's a good point. I, I hadn't considered the opposite way, that uh, it might just fuel more motivation to uh, go over there. But I, I just think that there's quickly becoming a general idea that things aren't going as well over there as the administration tried to portray they were. The, it, it kind of reminds me of how anti-abortion or pro-life, or whichever term you want to use, uh, activists used pictures of late-term fetuses that have been aborted mm -hmm. and to try and... And I've seen, I'm not saying uh, coming down for or against abortion here. I'm just saying that uh, if you see, you know, it's hard to stomach some of these pictures. I mean, they're, they're pretty oh, sure, good. sure. Um, well, and, and for years, this sort of thing has been used to further political interests one way or the other. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say one more thing, if I could. Sure. Um, I've been uh, concerned a little bit lately because I've been hearing more or less libertarian people once again rationalizing about choosing between the uh, Democratic presidential candidate and the Republican presidential candidate, um, particularly uh, high-profile libertarian-leaning people like such as Joe Sobern, who, who I recently read a column by him that said we should re-elect Bush and vote for Bush because everything that he's done is so bad he should be held responsible when it all goes to pot uh, if he is there for another four years. And uh, people like uh, Charlie Reese, who is also a libertarian-leading columnist, who says you know we, should, we have to vote for Kerry, uh, and voting is, you know, if you want to send a message, use uh, Western Union or whatever. Um, but uh, uh, voting is for... Your votes are supposed to be used on people who can actually win. And, and, and for whatever the short-term consequences might be. Right. And it's just uh, very – I think that people have to realize that there's always going to be some rationalization that you can think of for trying to choose between the lesser of two evils. At every election, you can make an excuse like that. But if we're ever going to get anything we want, uh, you have to resolve to stop – trying to choose between things that neither of which are pleasing to you and we have to do it as soon as we have to do it we have to start now is my point if you keep voting for the lesser of two evils you are guaranteeing that you will never have any choice except between two evils because you are never going to let them know that they can't get away with continuing to present to you evil people as the choice they have no reason to reform if you're going to vote for them regardless of what they do just because they can prove to you that the other guy is about two percent worse than their guy and of course even that may not be true but that's the basis on which they're doing it and as long as you will continue to vote for them under those circumstances they have no reason to reform they have no reason to change they have no reason to ever do anything to make government smaller as long as you're willing to continue voting for them as they make government bigger simply because you believe maybe rightly maybe wrongly that the other guy would have made government one percent bigger and, you know this is just like what we were talking about at the beginning of the show of focusing on the wrong thing it's focusing on which one is one percent less worse than the other when we should be focusing on what it is we really want which is to get rid of the income tax to end the war on drugs to end the United States meddling around the world, and neither of the candidates wants to do that. And so we should be voting for the things we want, either by voting libertarian or by not voting at all, which is in itself a vote. Absolutely. And I, I think the, this whole idea that a divided government is, the, is, is supposed to be some, getting a divided government between Democrats and Republicans is somehow supposed to be satisfying to us is just bunk. I don't think that anything significant is that the government's going to stop growing just because we have a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. I don't think history bears that out. So I don't understand these, these rationalizations that, that so many people are trying to make in order to persuade themselves that there's some that there's some uh, effect that they're going to be able to have on the outcome of the election uh, in a positive libertarian sense. That's well, I, I, want to say. I think part of the reason that some of these people do this is because they are playing to their audience to a certain extent, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but they just feel that their audiences would not accept their saying, don't vote at all or vote only libertarian, because they believe their audiences do not understand how not voting or voting libertarian could possibly do anything to help the situation, and so they feel they have to choose between the Republican and Democrat in order to be relevant to their audience. That may not be the way they would describe it to you, but I think unconsciously that's really what's going on, and so they find themselves in a position of having to choose between Kerry and Bush, and that's unfortunate. So maybe we need to educate libertarians before we can expect libertarians to educate others, but 
That's, of course, saying that we're right and the other libertarians are wrong. Jonathan, thanks for your call. Thank we you. have another hour to go, so please don't go away. This is Harry Brown. Let's go back to the phones. Joel in Farmington, Maine. Good evening, Joel. Hi, Harry. How are you doing? I'm just fine. What's up tonight? Well, listen, I've been listening to your program now for a couple of months, and I really admire the ideology that you're putting forth and everything, but i got to tell you, I'm an honest skeptic when it comes to politics. And I also listen to Coast to Coast uh, AM. I don't know if you ever catch that show. but uh, No, who's the host of it? Uh, George Nori, and on weekends it's uh, Art Bell. I've heard of George Norrie, and I believe I've been interviewed by him back in the campaign days, and certainly Art Bell I know. Art Bell's a, a very, very simpatico fellow, and I don't agree with everything that he believes, but uh, he's uh, certainly a wonderful host and a very nice fellow. So what were you going to say about them? Well, the reason why I mentioned it is because uh, Art Bell started something many years ago, and you were mentioning something about the Internet and how it was uh, fresh and how the media has been set up. It's kind of a closed loop, and anybody that's attempted to get heard uh, before the Internet came along knows exactly what I'm talking about. I don't, I don't think we need to discuss that too much. And I think you're right about the Internet and, and stuff. The problem I have is that what's circulating on Coast to Coast AM, and they have, I guess, about a 5 to 10 million uh, audience, listener audience at any given time, and that's a lot of people, and they seem to, even though I don't agree with a lot of the gas and a lot of the thoughts on that show, there, it does seem to be a porthole for you know some fresh thinking and some fresh news and fresh perspectives, which the regular media, uh, they won't, a lot of it they won't touch with a 10-foot pole. Okay? Mm, sure. So one of the things that I've listened to on that show over the course of the last few months is something about a shadow government. Do you know anything about a shadow government? Well, as a matter of fact, uh, it was two weeks ago on this broadcast that somebody raised that question and said that libertarians ought to have a shadow government, issuing pronouncements every time the party in power, right now the Republicans, were to issue some pronouncement or propose some law or something else that the libertarian shadow government should issue a press release and criticize it. And I pointed out that it wouldn't do any good because the press releases that the shadow government from the libertarians would issue would probably not be heard and read. Libertarians do issue press releases, and sometimes they are uh, paid attention to by news media, but the fact that we had a shadow cabinet would not really increase our chances at all. They have it in England, but the shadow cabinet is the second party, not the third party. Okay. And I'm not sure how you're defining the shadow government, but what my definition is, I would understand it. And, and what you're saying is, you're going to have to define that for me. My definition of shadow government would be the type of thing that, that let's say, you were talking about all the assassins that have taken place, and that you would have your own personal hired um, bodyguards, okay? Mm -hmm. And the thing that I'm thinking, I see this in my head, I'm kind of a creative guy and, and do a lot of different things, and I'm sitting there uh, kind of receptive to some of the things that are coming in from coast to coast, and I get a picture of a guy that's elected president, and the first thing he finds out is he gets into his his uh, car, okay, that's being driven, chauffeured for him, his two guys are in there walking him in, and they both pull out guns, and they point him to his head, and they say, now that you've been elected president, sir, there's a couple of things that we need to brief you on. Number one, and they, then they pull out the photos of the guy's wife and kids and family and says, now you may not care about the fact that, you know, you care about your life so much, but how would you like it if each one of your family members just happened to disappear? Well, let's get a few things straight, sir. That's the shadow government. That, that there would be no issue anything issued from the shadow government. The shadow government, according to thought, has been around since time began. Because I see what you're getting at. Yeah, you know what I'm getting at? That there's some secret conspiracy going on behind the scenes that's pulling the strings No, 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 not a conspiracy. You see, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's, it's some people are proposing that there's actually a government of individuals that are high-power individuals that control the strings around the world in terms of oil, in terms of making war, in terms of who's this and that. And if you actually think about it a little bit, uh, it, it's... It's so, it seems like it's so close to truth that it's scary. And here's the problem, Harry. Since, since you and I have been alive, I'm a baby boomer. I'm 54 years old, and in 1955, I remember seeing that Indian pattern on TV and waiting for Howdy Doody. And I, I am literally one of those people that have watched, grown up with the media. We used to have three choices for our news, and then PBS came along. We had four. And after that, it's, it's, it's gotten very homogenized and, I must say, quite chaotic. You know, and it makes you wonder. Here it is. Can you imagine an invention that people are dying to go out and buy, pay hundreds of dollars for, put it in their homes only to get programmed by it. That's what I'm afraid of. I think of the shadow government as behind all a, a, a lot of the programming. In other words... Yeah, I follow that. I think everybody else does, too. But, but we have to get right, right to the point, and that is, what do you propose to do about this if that's really true? I, you know what, Harry? I really don't have any answers. I've been trying to think about that as to how, how uh, the Internet could be utilized for that. But the problem, the thing that I don't think that you mentioned is, yes, there's a lot of hype out there, but what, and maybe some caller, somebody could call in and tell us what the answer is. I'm not sure that we're not screwed. Well, the answer, in my view, is to do whatever we can to reduce the power of the United States government. And uh, the more we reduce that power, the less that whoever controls it can do to the American people, whether it is the people we see on television, uh, like George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld and uh, so on, or whether 
whether it's people we never heard of who are behind the strings, uh, behind the scenes, pulling the strings in the back of George Bush and Donald Rumsfeld and the other people. Uh, right. That that was the whole idea of small government was that it, you could oh, really you could, you could really have a bad president and it wouldn't hurt the country because there was so little that he had the power to do to the American people. And it's the same thing when people talk about well the Jews are trying to take over the world. So what? Right. If that were really true, what would you do about it? What you would do is to reduce the power of government so that these awful people who are trying to control the world can't use the government because it's only through governments that people can control you. Uh, small-time hoods, even the mafia, are small potatoes. They can't rule the world. They can't control uh, the American society. What about, about Al-Qaeda? They, they have to work through government. What Al about Al-Qaeda? I mean, look at, look at what they... Al-Qaeda can disrupt things. Al-Qaeda can plant bombs. Al-Qaeda can kill people. But Al-Qaeda can't rule the world without taking over governments and having the legality of force that government provides. And yeah, so, but, but, so, wait, 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 Harry, Harry, they've taken over the, the, the voters of Spain. Didn't they change parties? Didn't they time that perfectly to get... The people of Spain did not want to be in the Iraq war. From the very beginning, the polls were overwhelming. And I'm not talking about 51 to 49 percent. The polls were like 70, 80 percent, saying that they did not want to be in the Iraqi war. So I don't say that would have happened anyway. I don't happen to know what George Bush offered the prime minister of Spain in order to get him to go against public opinion and send troops to Iraq. Now, whether the ruling party would have been thrown out without that terrorist attack, I can't say for sure. It may have been enough to just tip the scales just enough to put it over. But the fact the matter was that this was not appeasement on the part of the government that took over after the election because they had been opposed to the Iraqi involvement all the way along. Of course, Al-Qaeda can influence people. I can influence people. You can influence people. The question is how much. Nobody can influence people the way government with guns and threats of fines and imprisonment can influence people. Do you believe that the uh, uh, senior George Bush, uh, he lost, and then the younger George Bush comes in and picks up where dad leaves off? Uh, I mean, it's been... You know, I don't know if it's hearsay or it's rumor or it's true or it's not, but how do you feel about it in terms of George Bush, uh, you know, the younger George yes. Bush? Um, I, I understand. George, the, the Bushes seem to be a very close-knit family, and George Bush... The current president seems to be devoted to his father. Now, how much that influenced his obsession with Iraq, I'll never know, and probably no one will ever know outside of the Bush family. But the fact of the matter is that we do know that Bush was obsessed with Iraq from the moment he entered the White House, obviously from before that time, because he came into the White House obsessed with Iraq and wanting to get rid of Saddam Hussein, and that's all that we really need to know. We don't need to know why he had this obsession. If it was a legitimate obsession, he would have presented it to the American people, but instead all he did was present a lot of smoke and mirrors. So do you think that if people have a chance to vote, uh, they're going to vote either Republican or Democrat, and they, I'm being told that if you vote for Kerry, it's the same thing as voting for Bush. It doesn't make any difference. I agree. What you're voting for is big government, and that's what you're voting for with Bush. Thanks so much for your call, Joel. And before we go back to the phones, one last point about the Martha Stewart case. I don't think I've made this before, but if I have, it bears repeating. There's been a lot of talk about the lesson of the Martha Stewart case. Ah, oh, there's always a lesson, always a lesson. And the lesson is nobody's above the law, which, of course, is pure balderdash. Government officials are above the law. You can go to prison for lying to a U.S. attorney or a policeman or a prosecutor, but no government employee ever goes to prison for lying to you. Whether it's a politician making campaign promises he has no intention of keeping, whether it is a government official telling you that the U.S. government is running a surplus at the very time that it's running a deficit, whether it is a policeman telling you that you are involved in a conspiracy and that your so-called partner in crime has already ratted you out, whatever it is, they never, ever suffer any consequences for lying to you. So the lesson is not that no one is above the law. There are plenty of people in this country who are above the law. If above is the right word, I'd prefer to say below the law. So what is the lesson of the Martha Stewart case? It is very simple. Don't talk to government investigators. Do not cooperate in an investigation. Now, if you happen to be standing on the street and you happen to see an automobile accident and you're called to testify, that's one thing. You are not involved. But in any case in which you have any chance whatsoever of being prosecuted, do not say a word. If you feel you absolutely must talk, then speak to an attorney first. And if you do talk to anybody associated with the government, do not talk in the absence of your attorney. And this applies especially to tax matters. Don't ever go in personally for an audit. Even if you do your own tax return, if you get notice to appear for an audit, then go see H&R Block or some other accounting firm and ask the accounting firm to take your receipts, your information, whatever it is the government says that it wants, and present that to the IRS investigator, the agent, for you. You do not have to appear at a tax audit. You can have someone represent you, and it is worth the price, because anything that you might happen to say in such a meeting can be used against you. You may be joking about something. You may say something offhand. You may even be misrepresented as to what you did say. Somebody can haul you into court and say that you said something. You say, I didn't say that, and it's your word against the IRS agent. 
And whom do you think the jury is going to believe? Why would a government agent lie? Why would a policeman lie? Why would a U.S. attorney lie? They have nothing to gain by lying, but you have everything to gain by lying. That's the way the jury will look at it. So the lesson of the Martha Stewart case is do not say anything to anyone. In the Martha Stewart case, they couldn't convict her of insider trading. They could only convict her of lying to a government employee and obstructing justice. And if she had not said a word, there is nothing that they could have done because they couldn't convict her on the insider trading thing. There just was not enough evidence to do that. And it isn't even against the law to engage in insider trading. It is simply an SEC rule. Let's now talk with Roger in Clamor, New York. Good evening, Roger. Well, good evening, Harry. Thank you for taking the call. Uh, Harry? Yes. I right just here. wanted to tell you I wanted to congratulate the government. <laughs> are we, should we be sending telegrams? Well, of course. I, I mean, here they are. Remember how the Democrats were, were bothering uh, George W. Bush about our, quote, jobless recovery? Mm-hmm. Well, just now the government announced that we have all these new jobs that they were added. Hadn't been added in, in all these other previous months, according to the government statistics, but isn't it wonderful that this month now 308,000 supposed jobs were created? I mean, isn't isn't it wonderful how the government, whenever they get criticized, always finds something to temporarily solve the problem? Sure. Uh, everything's okay now. We don't have to worry about it anymore. That, that, is, that is correct. Um, that's what happens when you get the government involved in anything. That's why they've made changes to how the unemployment rate was calculated. And, um, you know, in the last, uh, in the previous administration and in this one. Yeah, you know, one thing that, uh, here again, here again, here's another instance of how the press fails to really keep us informed. I have not seen anyone on CNBC or any other financial program point out that the apparent recession and the question of the definition of a recession is really up for grabs. The official one is two consecutive quarters of negative growth. But it's obvious that this country has been in a slump for over three years. And, in fact, it's getting close to four years. And no one has pointed out that recessions typically are over in about 18 months, and that this one has just dragged on and on. Now, it's not all George Bush's fault. It started before he even was in office. But even when you inherit a recession from someone else, the darn thing is usually over within 18 months of the time that it began. And if you go back to all the post-war recessions, you find that they all were over in 18 months at most. But this one has just dragged on and on. Now, they blame it on 9-11. But 9-11 should not have affected the economy in any significant way except for the additional load of government that was placed on business business travelers, on people who have to make reports, and other people who have to conform to homeland security regulations that didn't exist before that. But even that should not cause a recession to drag on endlessly. It just something is in the wind here that is not being explored, and nobody's even asking about it. Yeah, that, that's true. And I mean, I just think that the government did a wonderful job now in solving the problem of their, um, you know, the jobless recovery. I mean, it's just it's just wonderful, don't you think? See, we, we need jobs. Snap, somebody snapped his fingers, and we got 300,000 new jobs. Yeah, isn't that wonderful? I mean, it's just like, I mean, we need a, a bogeyman. Boom, here comes al-Qaeda and Saddam Hussein. We need various things. All of a sudden, oh, here, here's what we got to do, whether the government should be involved in it or not. Mm-hmm. It's just, I, I really, so the government did a great thing. I mean, you really have to hand it to them. <laughs> they, they, they managed to keep themselves in existence, uh, and we, we really should thank them, because how else can we save ourselves without without our government saving us? Forum. Well, as I've said about 327 times in this broadcast, right. government knows how to break your legs and then hand you a crutch and say, see, if it weren't for the government, you couldn't walk. And this is probably one more example of it. Nobody really knows where those jobs came from, if they really do exist, and nobody knows what government policy could possibly stimulate more jobs other than just simply disbanding the regulatory agencies, repealing the minimum wage law, and doing all sorts of things that would make for less government, which is something that George Bush hasn't done and none of his predecessors did either, going back about 100 years. So part of this whole jobs thing is just a big mystery to everybody, and I think a president comes in office, crosses his fingers, and says to his economic advisors, do something to make jobs be created in this country, and the economic advisors cross their fingers and come up with different things so that if some by some magic jobs are created or appear to be created, the president then has a, can say, well, it's because of our policy of such and such. In Bush's case, it's because of the tax cuts. Well, the tax cuts are not as important as the fact that government has increased by leaps and bounds, which has drawn resources, real resources, not just money, but real resources away from the private sector, forcing them to pay more for those resources, to bid them away from the government, uh, which you can't do because government will pay any price. And the, the result has been that we have had an economy just dragging, 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 and I don't know how long it's going to go on. But that isn't what you were trying to get across. Roger, thank, thank you very much for your call. As always, glad to hear from you. Well, we have some emails piled up here that I will not be able to get to all of them before we say goodnight. But Martin in Phoenix says, yes, the Internet is a tremendous information asset in the fight for freedom. 
but only if we can get through all of the junk to really find the truth. The mass media isn't dead yet because it offers up everything in a nice, neat package. Perhaps the Internet will grow to be more easy to navigate and learn from as it goes. I just pray that the government try, doesn't try to get involved with making the Internet better. There's already talk of taxing emails because of all the junk mail coming through. What do you think of all this? Well, first of all, I think the Internet is easy to navigate. One way to approach it is to find two, three, or four sites that report news that you feel confident about. It isn't that the news will always be correct, but it will be that those sites are seeking out for you the news that you would like to know about. I simply don't have time to just surf the Internet endlessly every day, and when I do and get caught up in that, I lose a great deal of time. But there are several sites that have been very, very valuable to me. I, at the next break, will put them up on the links page. There's lourockwell.com, for instance. Every day there are about 12 articles linked on the site, and I usually read about half of them. And there's always two or three articles in there that I will save to my computer uh, because I think that I may have some need for it at some point in the future. Antiwar.com is a good source of information about the war. Truthout is a liberal site that has provided a lot of good information about the war, along with a lot of chaff about needing more government programs and Bush having tax cuts for the rich and trying to repeal the welfare state and a lot of other liberal baloney, but a great deal of good information about the war. So you find a few sites and you go to their, those as frequently as you like, and there you can get make it your portal to the kind of news that you want to know about. So I'm not feeling overwhelmed about the Internet and all the information, good and bad, that's on it. We just have a few minutes left, but maybe Bob in Buffalo, New York, can give us a quick, succinct thought. Bob, can you be briefer than I have been tonight? And Okay. I, I voted for you in the last two elections. I'm sorry I couldn't put you over the top, but uh, I was hoping you could tell me at what point in the history of the United States that our society most reflected the ideals of the Libertarian Party in terms of structure of government and just society in general. Well, I'd say probably 1789, and it was all downhill from there. Uh, actually, for the first 60 years of the country, while there were things that libertarians might object to, such as the way the Whiskey Rebellion was put down and some things like that, the politicians pretty much felt constrained by the Constitution. The Civil War broke things off open, really, with a vengeance, with Abraham Lincoln violating the Bill of Rights in every possible way. And then in the 50 years following that, we had a series of Republican administrations that were aimed towards bigger and bigger government. And fortunately, there was a break in their eight years of Grover Cleveland, which kind of reversed the trend a bit. But by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the country was very much unlike what it had set out to be. We had regulatory agencies. We quickly had a central bank, which Jefferson and Washington had been opposed to. And we then had an income tax, which was the worst evil of all, because it gave the government the money to do anything they wanted. And so we have been uh, fighting uphill for the last hundred years or more. I don't know if that really answers your question, but it is true that on any particular issue, whether it's health care, education, welfare, charity, whatever it may be, you can point to a time early in America where the problems that exist regarding that issue today didn't exist in this country because the government wasn't involved. I point right when Woodrow Wilson was president and we had uh, the 16th Amendment to the Constitution and had an income tax and a uh, uh, payroll withholding. I mean, that's the turning point. That's the turning point right there. Right. The payroll withholding came during the Second World War as a war measure, which, of course, was never repealed when the war ended, as so many war measures are never repealed after the war. But people sometimes say, name a country in the world where it, there are libertarian principles or name a country in the world that's better than the United States today or name a country in the world that doesn't have the problems the United States has. The important thing is not to compare the United States with other places in the world today, but compare it with what it was and what it could be. And that's what we as libertarians need to do to continually point out to people that it doesn't have to be this way. The country does not have to be continually at war. The country does not have to see more and more and more encroachments on our liberty. Taxes do not have to keep taking a higher and higher percentage of the national income. Government doesn't have to keep getting bigger and bigger. Bob, thanks so much for your Paul, I'm sorry we didn't have more time to chat, but check in with us next week if you like. And you folks out there in Radio Land, I do appreciate your being with me tonight, and be sure to tune in next week. But during the week, don't let this stuff get you down. There's so much still to enjoy in this world. Beautiful music, entertainment, love, good friendships. Take advantage of what you have, and don't focus too much on what we don't have. This is Harry Brown. I'll be back with you next week. Thanks again. <laughs>